Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you this morning, and it's good to be here to worship together and to praise God for such a wonderful salvation. Um, I'm replacing Roger Carswell this morning, so if you've come expecting him, uh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, Please keep Roger in prayer. He's uh, recently undergone an operation for prostate cancer, and he's on the mend, um, but he's he's not in a fit state to to come out and speak at the moment. So, So please remember him in prayer. Uh, I'm sure he'd be grateful for that. Now, I want to start this morning by um, getting you to do something. Nothing too taxing, you'll be pleased to know. But I want you, um, I'm going to give you 10 seconds to do this. I want you to just think of one thing this morning that you're thankful for. So you've got 10 seconds, think about that. Okay, that's about 10 seconds. So, quick show of hands. You can do this at home as well if you're watching at home or or you're somewhere else and I can't see you. It's okay, you can still play the game. Quick show of hands if what you thought of was family. Any of you thought of family? Yeah, most people sort of tend to think of that. Okay, what about show of hands if it was friends? Friends, there's only a couple of people got friends here this morning. (laughs) Bless you, we'll talk to you afterwards about how that works. Um, what about just for good health? Health, yeah, good. Mainly people right down the middle there. That's an interesting sort of little thing. Um, what about, I don't know, um, finances, food, having a job, not having COVID? There can be a lot of things we're thankful for and we should be thankful for as we gather together as the people of God this morning. But one of the things I want to challenge us with this morning as we look at God's word is this, that we can often be thankful for things, but forget the one who's given us those things. Uh, We can be thankful for all those things, and it's right, if you put your hand up then, it's right, if you thought of something else, that's right as well. We can be thankful for all those things, but we we forget the one who blessed us with all those things for which we are thankful. And that feeds into our Bible reading this morning. I want to read to you. From Luke chapter 17, Luke 17, and it's verses 11 through to 19. Luke 17, 11 to 19, and it says this. On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee, and as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers, who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan, Then Jesus answered, were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Let me just pray before we unpack that a little bit this morning. Father, we do want to thank you this morning for your son, Jesus. And we thank you that we've just been able to sing praises to you, to thank you for your son, for that sacrifice. Thank you that we've just been able to take communion together, remembered as we ate that bread and and, and drunk that juice, um, what Jesus did for us in um, a body broken and uh, a body bruised and battered and, and bleeding that we might be forgiven of our sin. Lord, may we be a thankful people for all that you've done for us. And as we look at your word this morning, we ask, Lord, that you, by your spirit, will come and speak to us, challenge us, help us, comfort us, rebuke us maybe even, Lord, whatever you desire, but by your spirit, come and speak to us, minister to us, teach us, Lord, that we might become a more thankful people, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Now, a reading from Luke's Gospel this morning is often seen as a story about being thankful, and and that it is. 
But like most stories in the Bible, and when we find Jesus interacting with people, there's a lot more there than at first meets the eye. And this morning, we're going to consider some of the things under the following three headings. First of all, we're going to consider the importance of bringing our problems to Jesus. The second thing is this, the importance of doing what Jesus tells us. And thirdly, the importance of thanking God for his goodness. So first of all, the importance of bringing problems to Jesus. And we pick up in the reading this morning that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. He'd been to Jerusalem uh, numerous times. But this was to be his final trip there. He was going to fulfill that for which he'd been born. It was on this visit to Jerusalem that he was going to die on the cross. We've been thinking about that as we shared communion together this morning. And we might wonder, what did he feel like as he was going on that journey? I wonder what you and I would have felt like. You know, if you knew that you were going there and you knew what was going to happen, it was your last final journey. Now, one thing that Jesus seems to be very, very good at, is that he seems to be able to live in the present moment. He would have been fully aware of where he was going and what was going to happen, but he still had time for people, he still had time for what was happening in the present moment. He was able to practice what he preached, you see, because remember elsewhere he said this in Matthew 6 and verse 34, he said, Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And man, I I really struggle with that. I don't know if you do. To just live in the present moment. If I know something is coming up that I'm not looking forward to, a bit like preaching at somebody's own mission, you know, I, I worry about that for days. It's on my mind. I can't concentrate on other things. I don't seem to have time for everyday living or or, or people in my life at times. You know, I recently had to go to hospital. It was a a delayed hospital appointment because of COVID. And uh, it was for a a not a very pleasant procedure, which you don't need to know about this morning. But if you're really sick, I'll tell you about it afterwards, if you come and have a word with me personally. And as the day approached, as it got nearer to that time when I had to go to the hospital, I I was dreaming about it. I I, I was worrying about it. It consumed all my waking moments. I, I don't know if that resonates with any of you. Or, or it's just me. I, I remember when I was a, a teacher in a secondary school as well. I, like a lot of teachers, really look forward to half term. Our, our daughter Beth was here last week. She's a primary school teacher. And she's like all teachers. She's just fitted right into the mold. If you ask her, you know, how many days have you got left to your next break? She can tell you precisely. Hours, minutes, seconds. They, they're counting down. And I was like that. And you look forward to those half terms. And when the bell went on the Friday afternoon of half term and that final child left the classroom, there was a huge sense of relief. Suddenly the world seemed a better place. It, it was brighter. As I realized I wouldn't see those little darlings for another nine days. But I didn't enjoy all those nine days that I was off. I tended to enjoy the first five But then you went into the part where you were thinking about going back again. It's a bit like a roller coaster ride, isn't it? I don't know if you've been on on the the, the big one at um, uh, Blackpool Pleasure Beach where you go up and up and up and you're sort of looking and you can see everything. You can see out to sea, you can see all the houses, you see all the people. People are getting smaller and smaller and it's it's really exciting, you know. But then when you get to the top, you realize you've got to come back down again. And it was a little bit like that when I was teaching. So for five days I was happy, those final four days I'm thinking, oh no, I've got to go back. I've got to see these these kids again. I really love teaching, by the way, as you can tell. And uh, I I don't know if if that resonates with any of you. Um, If it doesn't, I probably need some counselling and you can tell me afterwards. But Jesus is on on his way to the cross. And if that had been me then that would have been on my mind for a long time. And I wouldn't have been able to think about anybody else or think about anything else. But he was able to live in the present moment. How we need to live each day in the present moment. See, because today is all we have. Uh, So Jesus is right to say, well, don't worry about tomorrow 
because tomorrow's got enough problems of its own, just live today. And we don't know whether we will even, even see tomorrow, do we? So let's try and live in the moment and enjoy the day. Now in this first couple of verses here it says, Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus travelled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And he was going into a village. Ten men who had leprosy met him. Now Luke records for us that he was travelling along the border between Samaria and Galilee. I want to suggest that this is not an insignificant detail. We can just skim over some of those things sometimes like they don't mean very much. But maybe I'm reading a little bit into this, I don't know. But I think there's a beautiful picture here of who Jesus really is and what his mission was. You see, as he's traveling between the border of, um, of, of, of Judea and, and Samaria, he's straddling, as it were, with, with both uh, legs, on, a leg on one side, he's straddling what he came to do. He's come to be the savior of the whole world. Both nations, both Jew and Gentile. He's for all people, regardless of race, regardless of, of anything else. He's there for everyone. And as he's walking between Samaria and Galilee here, it's, uh, it's, it's a sign, I think, of who he is and what he's about to do. We, we do a thing on Saturday uh, evenings called Real Lies with the Association of Evangelists, and we interview lots of different people. Last week, we interviewed a, a guy who's a... Uh, a Jewish guy who's become a, a Christian, a, fo a follower of, of Jesus, uh, Yeshua, as he would call him. Um, and one of the questions he was asked is, you know, why is it difficult for, for the Jews to accept Jesus? And he says, because the Jews don't believe that Jesus is for them. He's for you. It's not for them. You know, the, to, to be a, a Jewish believer in Jesus is to give away your identity, your your old culture, everything's wrapped up in you being a Jew. But they're wrong, of course, aren't they? Because Jesus came to be the saviour of the whole world. And here, as he is walking between Samaria and Galilee, it's like, here he is. I'm for all people. And as he goes into this village here, we see this is true because he's met by ten men who had leprosy. Now, we know, don't we, that leprosy is a very nasty disease, and it seems to have been very common in the time and place in which Jesus lived. And Luke records for us elsewhere in Luke chapter 5 that Jesus had encountered and healed a leper previously. We'll come back to that in a moment. But here we find Jesus um, going into this village and there are ten lepers living together along the border of Samaria and Galilee. Now it's said, isn't it, that birds of a feather flock together. And here we find ten lepers bound together by a common misery. Jews would not normally mix with Samaritans. But in this instance, because of the leprosy, ethnicity meant nothing. They had leprosy. They joined together. They had a commonality which, which transcended their ethnicity. This disease had made them all outcasts. They had to be removed from society. Hence, they're in a little village on the border of, of Galilee and Samaria. They were subhuman. They were seen to have no worth or value. Yet amongst these people that Jesus met, amongst these poor people, there would have been perhaps a sense of camaraderie, a, a sense of companionship, a, a sense of togetherness, drawn together by a common enemy. And I wonder what our modern comparison of this would be. I was thinking about this. And perhaps we would see this most evidently amongst people in our city who would, we would label drug addicts, alcoholics, homeless, often huddled together, separated from society by a common misery. I've not been out very often with, with Bruce and Adrian as they go out on a, on a Friday and Paul. Uh, but a couple of times I've been out with them you find these people all huddled together. They all know each other. They, they form a crowd. Uh, Bruce and Adrian and Paul know where to find them. They're all together. There's a commonality. There's something that binds them together. And people are walking around them and away from them and distant from them because they've got a disease. In Jesus' time, it was leprosy for these guys. In our time, it's maybe some of these things I mentioned. You see, misery of this kind has no class system. It, it doesn't discriminate. 
I remember an, an, an many years ago, before I came to Sunbridge, um, I, I'd, uh, I was looking for some work in the summer, and I ended up working for a short time at St. George's Crypt in Leeds, which is a, a homeless project. And I was always amazed. I used to go in on an evening, and people used to come in, and they used to bring all kinds of things in with them, these guys. And they would have to hand over anything they had, whether it be drugs, whether it be weapons. They really did. It shocked me the first time I went. I thought, what am I doing here? Could have got a job in Tesco or something. But um, I was there, and they would get a raffle ticket to pick them back up on the way out. But I always remember one guy used to come in each night, and he, he looked different to the rest. He was always very smartly dressed. He came on a bicycle. He had like a three-piece suit on, and he had bicycle clips around his pants because he'd come in on his bike. But he would sit with these guys, and he was one of them. He, I got to know this guy a little bit. He was a former university professor who in life got out of hand for him, and he took to alcohol. And uh, he lost his job at, at the university and everything. But he still like, dressed like he was a university professor. He still talked like he was. But he was bound together in misery with these guys whose life were lost to drugs, to alcohol, to homelessness. And here we find in this story, these ten lepers were together in a village, away from everyday society. And they, even there, they stood at a distance. They knew they couldn't approach anyone because they weren't allowed to. They had to be separate. And what did they do when Jesus entered the village? It says they called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Now what is Luke telling us here? was telling us that the lepers recognized Jesus. They'd heard of him. Or were they suddenly made aware of who Jesus was as he entered the village? We're not quite sure. But it seems they knew his name. They cried out, Jesus! And what does the name Jesus mean? It means God saves. God is salvation. They called him Master. They recognized he had authority. And they asked him to have pity upon them because only he could help them and they knew that. Now elsewhere in scripture when we find that Jesus has asked for help, Jesus would often say, what would you have me do for you? But on this occasion, he clearly knows what the problem is. He knows what the need is. And the lepers, recognizing the importance of taking their problem to Jesus, call on him Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Friends, where do we go when we've got problems? Do we call out on Jesus? Do we say, Master, have pity on us? Jesus, help me. I need you. I need you in my life to deal with this issue, with this problem. Or do we go elsewhere? Do we, like the lepers, recognize the importance of taking our problem to Jesus? Do we, like the lepers, realize that Jesus has the power to deal with our particular problem? Do we, like the lepers, recognize that Jesus is master? See, recognizing who Jesus is and the authority in which he has leads us to our next point. The importance of doing what Jesus tells us. Now, some of you will know that before I, I, we came to Sunbridge, we were in the Salvation Army, and there's a, a song in the Salvation Army songbook, and I'm going to read some of the words of it to you. Listen to these words. It says, There's a path that sometimes, that's sometimes thorny. There's a narrow way and straight. It's called the path of duty, and it leads to heaven's gates. While we tread this path of duty, we will find our needs supplied from the river of God's mercy that is flowing close beside. By the pathway of duty flows the river of God's grace. I have a problem with that song. I think it's badly worded. I don't think it should be by the pathway of duty, you see. I think it should be by the pathway of obedience. You see, because duty means responsibility, obligation, or even a burden But obedience talks about compliance or even submission. You see, if you know Jesus as master, you want to be compliant. You want to be submissive to what he tells you to do. It's not therefore a burden or an obligation or responsibility. You see, duty smacks of works righteousness. 
where obedience speaks of trusting in the one who gave you the command. And Jesus responds to the leper's cry for mercy with a command. He says, go show yourselves to the priests. What was that all about? Well, they, they knew. Luke records for us in his earlier story of Jesus healing a leper what this was about. In Luke 5 and verse 14, it says this. He's there with a the leper and he says, Then Jesus ordered him, that's the leper, Don't tell anyone but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. You see, a sign of cleansing, a sign of healing from God, well, how's that proved? Well, you go and show yourself to the priest, you offer a sacrifice to Moses, which is commanded for your cleansing, and it will be a testimony to them. So Jesus is saying to these lepers, look, you just go to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed, and there would be a testimony to those priests that God had healed them. And so we're told that as Jesus told the ten lepers to go to the priest, they set off. Uh, they were obedient. They didn't ask questions. They said, wait a minute, why? Aren't you going to heal me first? Don't, you know, don't I have to do something else? Can't I chat with you for a bit? Can't you give me something to eat, something to drink? No, Jesus just says, no, look, just go to the priest. And they go. And it says that obedience brought about their healing. And we're reminded here of a story in the Old Testament. I'm sure it's, it's in your head as I'm talking about these things. The story of Naaman. In 2 Kings chapter 5, where it says, 2 Kings 5 verse 1, Naaman, the commander of the army of the king of Aram, he was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. And Naaman, the Syrian general, was told by Elisha to dip himself seven times in the Jordan River. Can you imagine someone saying that to you this morning? Can you imagine going up to Bruce afterwards? And, and notice I'm pointing you to Bruce, not to myself. You go to Bruce this morning and say, I've got a real problem, I need some healing. And Bruce is like, just go to local river and dip yourself in it seven times. All will be good. I wonder how many of you would do that. It sounds strange, but yes, Naaman's obedience to that brought about his healing. After the seventh time, he was totally healed. So he was obedient to what God was saying. And here's the challenge for us maybe this morning. Where is Jesus calling you and I to obedience? Where are we lacking obedience at the moment? Where are we being disobedient? Where are we not doing what he's telling us to do? Where are we willfully denying him in our lives? Are we willing to do what he says? Did these lepers have more faith than we do? You see, Jesus, master, go to the priests, they just went. No questions asked. They recognized his power and authority. They called him master. And as they were obedient to what he told them, it says they were cleansed. They were cleansed. Friends, you know, as, as believers on the Lord Jesus Christ, as Christians, God calls us to obedience. It's not about salvation. We're saved. We're already saved. But it's obedience. It's about living out that which God has done in our lives. Do we really thank him enough to just follow him, to trust him with all things? We can find ourselves when we've got issues of looking for answers in all the wrong place. We can listen to a different voice, a different master. But it's by the pathway of obedience that we find ourselves healed. That these lepers were going to find meaning, value and purpose in their lives. And again elsewhere, Jesus said these words in John 10 and verse 10. I have come that you may have life. And life in all fullness. Friends, he offers us life in all fullness. He knows what's best for us. So when he says do something, we just do it. We don't always have to fully understand it, but we do it because he knows what's best for us. And he wants to give us life in all fullness. And this leads us to our final point this morning. And it's this. The importance of thanking God for his goodness. Now Luke records for us what happened next. Verses 15 to 19, he says this. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? 
Where are the other nine? No one has returned to give praise to God except this foreigner. Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Now this is challenging, isn't it? The inference here, though we cannot know for certain, is that all but one of these lepers were Jews. And for this Samaritan, this foreigner, as Jesus calls him, he, he, he was doubly cursed. He was a Samaritan and he had leprosy. That's a double whammy. That's, that's not good for this guy and his life. But he, in obedience to what Jesus said, along with the other nine, goes to show himself to the priest and discovers himself cleansed. And what does he do? He comes back to thank Jesus. And this really goes back to where we began this morning as I got you to think about what to be thankful for. Because he went back to thank the one who gave him the cleansing. He could have just gone off and thanked God for cleansing. And that's good. We want to thank God for all his, his mercies and his blessings in our lives. But we can forget the one who did the blessing and who did the cleansing. But not this Samaritan, this foreigner. He came back to Jesus and thanked Jesus. It says he threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. What does it say about him throwing himself at Jesus' feet? It's like an act of worship, isn't it? You're my master. You're my Lord. You've cleansed me. And I thank you for what you've done in my life. It's interesting. The point of this um, tale here is that it was a foreigner who came back. Not the ones you thought would have come back. The Jews, the, the people of God. No, it's, it's the foreigner that comes back. We were at the book table in Bradford a couple of weeks ago on, uh, on Wednesday. And a guy came up to us and uh, he was talking to us. He was obviously a homeless guy and he was chatting away. And then he suddenly started singing at the top of his voice. And this is what he was singing. He was singing, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. And he's walking around the street. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. He sat, he sat on a bench and he's carrying on. You came from heaven to earth to show the way. And they're like, what's going on here with this guy? Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? That it was this outcast, this homeless guy, this guy who we maybe never see in this church. I, I don't know. We pray one day he might walk through our doors. He's there, he's picked up this song from somewhere, and he's in the middle of the town center singing that for all to hear, praising Jesus. Isn't that interesting? The one you thought wouldn't be doing that is the one doing that. And this is the equivalent of us, I suppose, as the so-called people of God, not thanking God. You know, we're the ones that are supposed to thank God. We, we're the ones that know him, have a relationship with him through Jesus and the sacrifice that was made but no, it's the outcast, it's the foreigner that's singing his praises. I was greatly challenged, as I, I trust you are too, as I tell you that story this morning. So here's the challenge for us in, in summing all this stuff up. Do we thank God for his goodness? Or do we just accept all that he gives us and then just get on with our lives, as these lepers seem to have been doing? Do we cry out to God? And once he's given us what we ask for, do we instantly forget him? Jesus showed mercy to the ten, but only one was thankful. Shouldn't we as the people of God be most thankful? You know, the one who returned, to the one who returned, Jesus said this in verse 19. Jesus said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. Now, in the Greek, that word well can mean saved. Let's read that with that word saved in there. Rise and go, your faith has saved you. Has saved you. It's, it's, it's just a thought in my head. Is it possible to know God's goodness, to know God's answer to, to prayer, to know God's mercy, to know God's healing in our lives, and yet not be saved? Uh, the nine were cleansed of leprosy, but were they saved? Were they just healed and then they ran off, never to be seen again? We, we don't know. Now, friends, we're not saved by works. The Bible's really clear about that. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves. It's all of Jesus. But by faith in the Lord Jesus, we're saved. 
and we give thanks to him for that. There's much for us to be thankful for this morning, isn't there? For family, for friends, for work, for whatever it is you were thinking about as I began this morning. And we should be thankful. But let's not forget to thank the one who's given us all those things. Thank God for his mercy, for his grace, which is evident before us as we take communion this morning. Thank God for his faithfulness. Thank God that our sins are forgiven. And thank God that our names are in the book of life. Because you know that's what Jesus said. To those who went, he sent, when he sent his disciples out, and they came back and they were jumping up and down in excitement, you know, even the demons sort of have to leave when we, we tell them to, and they're rejoicing about all those things. Jesus said, that's all well and good, but don't rejoice in those things. Rejoice in the fact that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Friends, is your name in that book? If it is, be thankful. If it's not, what are you doing? Put your hope and your trust in the Lord Jesus. See him as master and let him lead you in your life. Let me pray. Father, we just thank you for your great mercy and love to us. Lord, we're so grateful for all that we have in our lives, Lord. And we could spend, we could spend this past hour or so just test of, testifying to your goodness and all the things that we have because of you. And Lord, it's so easy to be thankful for things and forget the one who gave us those things. And Lord, this morning, forgive us if that's been us. Forgive us, Lord, if we've been thinking about the gift rather than the giver of the gift. Lord, we thank you for your love, your mercy, your grace. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who comes and indwells us and seals us that we are we're, we're assured of a future with you. Not because of us, but because of that cross, that bloodshed, and our faith in him who died for us. We thank you this morning, Lord, that if we are putting our hope in you, our names are written in that book of life. And we can go from this place this morning rejoicing, being thankful, because we're secure in you. Lord, I pray for each of us here this morning. May we have a great week this week. And whatever we find happening, Lord, may we be a thankful people. And we thank you for your faithfulness. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.